1 Peter chapter 4. So in the second part of this chapter, because we looked at the first part last week, Peter's you know, still speaking about suffering because he looked at that, but now he's talking about the suffering being a fiery trial. And, and this fiery trial was about to come upon uh, the believers that were scattered throughout Asia Minor, and it was going to come very, very strong. So the church had been suffering personal persecution from the people around them, but now... They're going to face the official persecution from the political leaders above them. It's one thing to be persecuted by family members and friends and even be outcast by them. It's a whole nother thing to be persecuted by the political leaders who make the laws of canceling out Christianity. Who make the laws that say, if you're a follower of Christ, you will be put to death by anyone who can get a hold of you. And when that kind of pressure comes on, that's a fiery trial. You know, we stand here in America, we can express our faith boldly and openly. And we're coming to a day and age where that's coming to a close. It's coming down to a short line. And and God's trying to show something here through that. But up to this point, as Peter's sharing, Christianity was tolerated by Rome only because it was considered a sect of Judaism. So the attitude was beginning to change, and with Nero, the fires of persecution began to come in, and any other emperor that followed after him, and there were a few, um, they would just come heavily upon the church. They were going to kill people in horrible ways. And here's Peter writing to the church, saying, this is what's coming. It is a trial like you've never faced before. Your life will be on the line. Your your wife might be raped in front of you and then killed. Your children will probably be executed before your eyes. And then you'll be dragged off to Rome where you'll be fed to lions. Now I could say that to people here and say, this is what's coming to you next week. It, It might put the fear of God in you. Or you might think I'm out of my mind. And Peter's writing to believers who are going to face that kind of trial. What would you say to someone who you know would face that kind of trial in the next few months in their life? Would you build them up and encourage them? Would you tell them, well, better run off to Mexico and hide because your family's, this is your family on the line. And yet what Peter does is he instructs the believers to follow in the light um, of this fiery trial, to, to learn something. God is not going to stop the suffering. So through the suffering, there's something you need to learn. And this is what he tells them. Number one, look, this is the outline here. To learn to expect suffering in your life. If you're a follower of Christ, I don't mean just a believer. I mean someone who's saying, you know something? I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not just a Sunday believer, a Sunday saint, and a Monday ain't. No, I am committed my life to follow Jesus Christ. To live a godly life, I'm going to turn away from the things of the world that have destroyed my life and destroy the lives of people around me, the world that considers it foolish that I turn away from such things. I'm going to follow my Lord. And the second you take that step, you'd better expect suffering in your life. That's what he's telling them. The second thing is to learn to rejoice in that suffering. I could take great joy in many things, but suffering's really not been one of them. And yet yet he's saying, learn to rejoice in this suffering. Why? Because God has a purpose in it. And whose thoughts are greater than mine? His. Whose ways are higher than mine? His. Sometimes we view God in a way that we think, well, he's God, like, like he, I'm just me, but he's God, he's, he's above me. No, no, he's beyond me. He created the universe. He created all things. Yeah, he could think me out of existence if he wanted to. He's so much greater than, and sometimes we put him in a different category. We think he's just bigger than us. No. 
greater than. So learn to rejoice in suffering. Number three, to learn to take the time to examine your own life while you're suffering. You know, why am I suffering, Lord? Did I cause this? Or is this from you for your glory? You know, I I love when God uses me for my good in his glory. But I don't love when he uses me for his good in his glory. Because usually suffering's implemented in there somewhere. And yet that's what he's shown. Take some time to examine your own life while you're suffering. And number four, to learn that in your suffering, no matter what it is, you can still commit yourself to God. No matter what you face, you can still make a commitment. Lord, I am devoted to you. I am here to accomplish what you want done. And if this is what you have on my plate today, if it's trial, if it's tragedy, if it's trauma, whatever it is, whatever you've put on my plate, then you've put it there for a purpose and a reason, and I will be devoted to you while I'm going through it. That's what Peter has to say to these believers that are going to face life and death situations. And many, many will die and and give glory to God for it. So let's look at verse 12, the first one. You know, learn to expect suffering in your life. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. He's saying, listen, learn to expect suffering in your life. The first thing he says is beloved. This is really important. The word beloved here means the united children of God, the bride of Christ. And that's really important because the first thing Peter shows the church about expecting suffering in their lives is that you're not facing it alone. You might be somewhere off on your own somewhere, but you're not alone. You have brothers and sisters around this world that are facing suffering. Right now, someone is suffering because of their faith in Christ in China or Iran or Iraq, somewhere. Someone's being put to death because they firmly believe in their faith is in Jesus Christ. And they may be somewhere in a prison cell all alone, but they're not alone. Because our prayers are there for them, and we're with them because we're united in Christ with them. That's what he shows there. So beloved implies we as the bride of Christ, we will never face the sufferings of Christ alone. Because the prayers of the saints are there, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit's there, the love that God has for us will be there. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime, and you begin to see, how did they have the strength to face that? Well, they, they knew they were not alone. Well, no, he's tied up to a stake all by himself, but he's not alone. The Spirit of God is within him. The love of God is upon him, and the fellowship of the saints is surrounding him. And he's not alone. So he says, beloved. So because of this truth, beloved, we're not alone. He says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you. The term here, do not be surprised. Don't entertain the thought of being negative. Don't even entertain the thought of negativity here. And he says, at the fiery ordeal means the smelting of your soul which comes upon you for your testing, means which has been generated by God to what? To penetrate and prove you through that experience. God has a purpose in suffering. He says, as though some strange thing has come against you. Literally, that means foreign, like some foreign thing has conspired against you. So what Peter's saying here is, don't let yourself fall into being negative when God allows the pressing of persecution or maybe some difficulty or some heavy circumstance against you because of your faith in Christ. He's saying, remember, he's only proving you, he's proving to you that you belong to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, we're told those who try to live a godly life because they believe in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
When you and I begin to try to live a godly life, that's when the world turns against you. You can go to church every Sunday and just be a happy Christian and, and conform with everybody around you and just play that game and no one will ever be offended by you because you're a Christian. Oh, that's Ron. He just loves the Lord. Just let him go do his own thing. The second you say, you know something? I'm not touching that again. I'm not going down that road. I'm not using those drugs. I'm not hanging out with the old people. I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. The second you begin to live a godly life, the second you begin to call sin, sin, and you don't compromise in it, that's when the world begins to turn against you. Because now it hates what you are. Because what you are is being conformed to the image of Christ. And that's what he's showing them here. Um, you know, when you begin to try to live a godly life, the world turns. So what Peter's saying here, that's a normal thing. It's a normal thing. When you begin to live a godly life, that the world turns against you. So what's happening? God's beginning to mature you in Christ, and he's going to use suffering to strengthen you. In the book of Hebrews, you probably know it well. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Well, he suffered for our sins could be forgiven. It was more than that. How does he come and learn obedience? How do I learn obedience to God without suffering? I don't. Because the son suffered and learned obedience through it. And so, too, we will do the same thing. And that's what Peter's showing here in a strong way. you got to remember this. When you face suffering, you may think, you know, it's my body and it's full of pain and I'm getting older and it's not working or whatever the case is. Whatever the case is, God's allowed it on your plate. You can blame your age. You can blame anything you want. Blame somebody else all day. But it's your plate, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. So God puts things on your plate for a purpose and a reason. And you have to remember that maybe, just maybe, God's trying to penetrate the places that you won't regularly allow him to. Maybe for God to reach that part of your life, he's got to allow suffering in your life to break you down enough, to lay your pride low enough that you actually let him in and take lordship of there. He's doing a work, and that's what he does in each and every one of us. He's refining you and I into the person he desires us to be for the sake of his people. God will refine me for your sake. Do you understand? And if I'm going to be obedient to him, you're going to pay the price. Not me. I get blessed because I'm obedient to him. But if I'm obedient to him, I'm going to come up here and teach you his word. I'm not going to bend this word. But I'm going to be obedient to him. I'm going to call sin, sin, and let the word go out and do its work. Or I can be disobedient to him and come up here and do a nice, happy message so everybody feels good. But if I'm going to be obedient to him, you're going to pay the price. Because you're going to get a word that will penetrate your soul or really try to penetrate your soul to expose the pride that God wants put to death. And that suffering is a great part of that. So remember that. So learn to expect suffering if you're a follower of Christ. And as you do, keep your eyes on Jesus. And you know what happens if we do that? You become stronger and more secure in his unfailing love for you. You become stronger. And if anybody has walked that path, if you understand what I'm talking about here, because not everybody will. If you have suffered for Christ... And that suffering has brought you more onto maturity in God's love for you. You stand where you never stood before. All of a sudden, you're there. You're like, Lord, I am learning what it means to expect suffering. Why? Because I'm living a godly life. I've chosen to follow you and to trust you. And that's what Peter's showing the church here. 
Then in verse 13 and 14, he's going to tell them, learn to rejoice in your sufferings. Verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of, of glory and of God rests on you. So what he's saying here at the beginning of verse 13, what he, in, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, the degree here part speaks of rejoicing. And the sufferings of Christ doesn't speak of what Jesus suffered on the cross. It speaks of when the body of Christ suffers and you suffer with the body. That's what he means here. The, the fellowships of believers that are scattering all about, when they begin to suffer and you're suffering for Christ within the body of Christ, he's saying, rejoice in that fact. Take joy in that. If you find your fellowship suffering for the sake of Christ or as a whole, the body of Christ, you begin to start to, let's say our fellowship, people begin to say, you know something? I'm tired of just being a religious person. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to talk with him. I want to trust him in every area of my life. I'm going to start putting aside. I don't want that. That's sin. I don't want it in my life. I put it away. And as a body of believers, we will begin to suffer within the community that we're a part of. Because we will be so set apart, it will look odd. We'll look weird. And, and so to that degree, he's saying, you know, you're suffering. Rejoice in the fact that it proves that you're his. Remember in the book of Acts chapter 5, I think it's verse 40 or 41. Peter and the apostles were brought before the Jewish council. They were told by the high priest, stop filling this place in Jerusalem with that man's name. Stop it. So they brought him in and they scourged him. They flogged him. And they sent him out. They said, okay, now get out of here, but do not speak in the name of Jesus. They let him go. It says, I think in verse 41, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, what? Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's what Peter's talking about. Lord, that we would suffer for your glory. If you suffer persecution or whatever case, whatever that suffering may be, because you know it's because of Christ in you, the hope of glory, then you rejoice in the fact. Because you know what it means? It proves you're his. It proves you're setting your life apart for his glory. So what Peter's saying here is be of good cheer when you find yourself suffering for Christ and even consider it an honor to suffer for him. Because when his glory is revealed uh, to me and in me, then I'll be willing to suffer for his namesake no matter what comes upon me. You find out all of a sudden this, all it is is suffering. I, I understand in my life there are people that don't like me. But I also understand because of who Christ is in me, that it's not me they don't like, it's him. And they can get mad at him and curse him and scoff at him all day. And you know what? Doesn't affect me at all. Doesn't affect me at all. Say whatever you want to say. You're not speaking to me. I'm not here for my gain. I'm not here for my glory. I'm not here to accomplish what I want done. I'm not going where I want to go. I'm obedient to what he wants me to do. And if I suffer for it by the hand of one or by the hand of 10,000, I know with an absolute assurance I can take joy in that because it's not me they're coming against. It's him in me. And that's who they see. And that's what Peter's trying to show them here. At the end of verse 13, you know, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice uh, with exaltation. You know, so when, when the glory of the divine nature of Christ uh, appears, it's going to be manifested to all mankind. That's especially through his saints, through you and I. We're going to radiate his glory. We go out and we share the gospel with people. Sometimes we don't even talk. Sometimes we're just talking with each other and sharing Christ with each other and people look on. And it's not us they see, it's him. 
We come together. So many times we come together and people wonder, you know, I know what you're really all about. I know this guy over here and he got in trouble with the cops and he's in this and this guy is using drugs blah, blah, and this guy he drinks all the time. And this and then you guys all come to church. You're all happy. You're all fake. Like, no, we're not fake. We're forgiven. We're washed clean. We're, we're walking anew. And it really bothers some people. So he's saying, take joy in that. You know, it's why God has given us faith that we might trust him against our own nature, that we might trust what his son has accomplished for us on the cross. Real important. So when we suffer in our body, uh, or easier put, I guess when we face when, our, when my own personal character is being attacked painfully, that's when I trust in God's way. That's when I continue on in humility in spite of what comes against me because that's what shows people what I'm really made of. That's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Shows people what's really going on in my heart because, because it's him, not me. And, and that's, that's, you know, all I am is flesh. Spirit part, that's him. It's a new life that he's given me. So the divine nature of Christ is in me, and what I'm doing is trusting him through the suffering. And in that, I can find joy. In verse 14, he says, if, you, if you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Reviled here literally means to be charged with contempt, to be treated with scorn, shame, and disgrace. So if because of the name of Christ, you're disgraced, shamed, or treated with scorn, he's saying, you're blessed. And the blessed part there means happy. It doesn't mean pretend happy. It means joyfully happy inside. Though people press against me and pour upon me contempt and scorn and disgrace, if I understand it all because of the name of Christ, then I can remember that I've been given the joy of the Lord to lean upon. What's the song we sing? The joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. And we lean upon that. How do I lean upon the strength of the Lord? Not like this. <laughs> but like this. Praise the Lord. Oh, you broke your arm. Praise God. He's got a purpose in it. Oh, you had cancer. Praise God. Maybe he wanted me to talk to the doctor. I mean, how many times? I could tell story after story since I've been here to spend 20 years. So many times. I end up at the hospital sometime. It was Dr. Linder, I think. I was bleeding really bad. He comes in. He's like, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you're bleeding. I'm like, you know what? I found out he was Jewish. I said, I know why I'm bleeding. He's like, why is that? Because you're Jewish, and God sent me here to tell you about Jesus. And he's like, oh, what? I said, what do you do? I said, you're Jewish? Okay, so how are your sins forgiven? He was like, well, I go on the mission field, and I do work, and I go, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Why do you think they called Jesus the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the lamb who died. His blood was shed. And he was looking at me like, whoa, I got to come to your church sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Then I stopped bleeding. I'm like, okay, they had a purpose in it. I could have curled up into a bum bleeding. I'm so hurt. I'm bleeding. I'm so hurt. No, go to the doctor. You have people say, you're a Christian. You go to the doctor? You bet I go to the doctor. There's somebody there God wants me to share with. The guy was doing my surgery. And uh, I said, you know who's guiding your hands, right? <laughs> you, God, we had, I had you before. You did my ear. We talked about Jesus big time. And he did a really good job. Who really did it? He really did it. Through that guy. And we'll meet him again, too. <laughs> That's for sure. I told him, I'm going to get cancer just to come back and see you again. He was like, don't do that. I'm like, oh, you, you, you have no idea who you're talking to, man. Because um. <laughs> so he says, you're blessed um, because the, the glory of God um, rests upon you. Verse 14. 
The spirit of the glory of God rests on you. It just means that the spirit of God has inhabited you, has come to live within you. So now, because it's, it's not my joy that makes me happy. It's the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Lord now dwells within me. So I can lean on him and trust in him, not on me. The Holy Spirit doesn't scour. The Holy Spirit doesn't grumble. The Holy Spirit, think of him as the joy of the Lord. He brings comfort. He's the great comforter. He gives direction. He's not going to lead me down some road for my destruction. He's going to lead me down a road for the glory of God. And if that road has suffering or pain, so what? We live in a fallen world. It won't be perfect until we get home. And when we get home, we meet him in the golden city. When we get there, all the pain, all the tears will be gone. All the sorrow will be gone. And we have a taste of that now in the Holy Spirit. We have the joy of the Lord that's alive in our heart. In Isaiah 35, verse 10, it's speaking of this time. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy on their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You know, when we simply are willing to put our trust in Christ to be called by his name, when we simply are going to trust his nature in us, people will naturally begin to consider you and I as a reproach and speak evil against us. And when that happens, what Peter's saying here is learn to rejoice in that suffering because it means they're seeing Christ in you, not you. They're warring against him, not you. I can't tell you how many times in counseling I've said to someone, stop taking it personal. It's no longer you. It's Christ in you. So when you're insulted, don't get personal. It's Christ they see. They're not offended. Maybe some of your children don't know Christ and you try to talk to them and they don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Get out of here. It's not you they're offended with. Well, you always bring it up. You're going to, I knew you were going to bring it up. Of course I'm going to bring him up. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. So what do you do? What do you do? You understand it's Christ in you that disgusted at. Because he's the truth. He's the way. He's the light. He's the life. And they see him. And you rejoice in that. Take great joy in that. Yep, it's mom and dad here to talk to you again. Yeah, it's Jesus, man. He loves you. And then we're going to stop saying it, right? Oh, just keep going. You know, so, so we, we learn to rejoice in our suffering. Then verse 15 through 18, you know, learn to take some time to examine your life. He says in verse 15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. That means a gossip. You notice how he puts gossip up in the line with murder, thief, and evildoer? That's because it damages. Verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it is with difficulty that the righteous are saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? So he's saying, take some time. Learn to examine your own life. If you're facing suffering, stop. Lord, what is going on in my life? Did I cause this? Or is this because I love you and I'm being conformed into your image? God will clearly make it very, very clear. So, you know, in, in 15, if anyone suffers, the suffering here um, literally means to endure through that which is painful, disagreeable, and distressing. It's pressure. He's saying, if you're suffering because you do what's 
what's not right, then your suffering's just steeped in your pride. It's going to accomplish nothing for the glory of God. It's only going to justify your pride. But if you're willing to suffer as a believer or, or because of your being made into the image of Christ, then God will be glorified by any choice you make because you're looking to his son facing your trial. So he says, look at yourself. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says to the church, keep examining yourselves to see whether that you're continuing in the faith. Constantly test yourself. He says, do you not know that Christ lives in you? Constantly look at that. Here, I'm facing this crossroads, Lord. I've figured it all out and I see it won't work or it will work. But what, what's your will here? Is this where I'm going? Or is this where, where you want me to be? Because I want to... I want to step where you want me to be. I've done enough of figuring things out to see if they're going to work or don't work in my life. I want to be where you want me to be. And it, it takes time to look at yourself in the midst of your suffering. To see if you're doing it for yourself or you're doing it you know, for the glory of God. And you'll know if you're suffering because of Christ in you or because it's, you're causing your own suffering. So he says, you know, examine yourself. Take a look there. In verse 17, he says, For it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? So it's time. It means it's far past the time. For judgment to begin, that means the conviction of sin he says, in the household of God, that's the church of the living believers. That's us, you and I, the followers of Christ. And so what he's showing here is the gospel, and you've got to remember, it's a two-edged sword. The gospel pierces the heart, convicting it of sin, and then it pierces and exposes the sinful heart of a human being to the sacred heart of God, showing the sinner its need for salvation. That's what the gospel does. That's why Satan doesn't want the gospel to go out. Because it goes out and the first thing it's going to do is convict you of sin. And people in today's day and age, nobody wants to be convicted of sin. Except born again believers. They understand the work that's there. But the secular world certainly doesn't even want to hear the word sin anymore. And yet the gospel goes out. The first thing it's going to do, phew. Convict you of sin. It's going to face you, challenge you, and show you your desperate need to look to the Savior for salvation. So if you're a believer, what he's saying here, it's far time past that these trials begin in your life. And, and it's got to begin in the very place where you're called to serve him, and that's within the fellowship of believers. <clears throat> That's the place where believers gather to be in fellowship. It's the place we come together to praise his name. It's the place we come together to walk through the word of God together. It's the very place that we're commanded to not forsake. It's the very place we're learning how to walk in godliness together. How do I learn to forgive? Unless I do you wrong. And I need to go up and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I blew up at you. I didn't mean to do it. Please forgive me. And how do I learn to forgive? By forgetting. I haven't forgiven if I don't let it go tomorrow. I haven't forgiven if a year goes by and I'm still bringing it up. Remember when you did me wrong? No, actually, I put it behind me. Have you done that? How do I learn to show mercy? How do I learn to receive mercy? Unless I'm challenged. And I'm not going to be challenged in the world. I'm going to be challenged right here within the, the context of believers. Within a fellowship of believers where the grace of God is between us. And we can learn to lay down our pride. Learn to lay down our lives. So that we can be molded into the image of Christ. That's what he's showing here. This is how God conforms us into the image of Christ. That's through the trials and afflictions and persecutions. We suffer together in Christ within a fellowship. 
We take those steps and we're not alone. We're together. And what Peter's saying here is, you think these things are difficult. If you think it's tough to walk that way, then, then how, if, if even able, think about those who don't know Christ. We looked at this last week in a very strong way. There are a lot of people in this world that are going to go to hell for eternity. That is no joke. It's just because people don't want to talk about it doesn't mean it's not real. And people go to hell because they reject the way God gave for salvation. I had a conversation a while back, I think I brought it up last week, with a, with a homosexual man. And he was like, well, so God's going to send me to hell because I'm a, a homosexual. Like, stop. Stop right there. You misinterpret the word of God. You go to hell because you reject the way of salvation. You don't go to hell because you're a homosexual. You don't go to hell because you're an alcoholic. You don't go to hell because you, you, you have some sin that you're struggling with in your life or you've given over to in your life. You go to hell because you reject the way of salvation. And if you receive salvation, then whatever that sin is in your life, you're going to have to call that sin, sin, before God. And if you can call it sin, you know, then you, you'll know, I need a Savior. And when a Savior comes into your soul, all of a sudden, you have a new heart. Not an old heart that says, well, I'm going to still live the lifestyle of living. No, a new heart comes in and you go, you know what? This displeases God because it says it in his word. So I'm turning from this and I'm turning towards him to walk with him. And I'm leaving all this behind. The second you do that, the whole world will come against you. And that's what he's promising here. And when that happens, take great joy in that. Because I know men who were homosexuals that are now married to women. Because God stepped into their life. And I know women who are lesbians that are now married to men. Why? Because Christ stepped in into their life. They saw the great need in their heart to call sin, sin. God revealed that to them. They trusted Jesus Christ and they live what God calls in his word a normal godly life. Regardless of what the world calls it. And that's just where we're here for a purpose and a reason. Not to condemn people because they sin. We're sinners ourselves. We're here to show them the light, to carry the weight of the gospel into their lives. Why? God loves them. He loves them. He wants them to be in eternity with him. He came to save a sinful world. And he, his desire is to see that every heart comes to know him and trust his son. God never takes away what we would consider our worldly joy. He fills us with the joy of the Lord. And that's a joy that unless you're born again, you don't know. But when you're born again, you've got the joy of the Lord in your heart. And it holds you. It keeps you. It's a strength for you. It sees you through each and every day. So that's what Peter's saying there. And then in verse 18... He says, he, he quotes here from Proverbs 11. He says, and if it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? So he's showing the church leaders here that even the most difficult believer in your fellowship is saved. So stop looking at what you consider and, and how you consider them. Start viewing people through the eyes of Christ. I can't tell you how many times people have come into our fellowship, they go, oh, that guy can't be saved. I know him and the life that he lives. There's no way he's saved. If he calls upon Jesus Christ as his Lord, guess what? He's saved. I'm not here to determine who is saved and who's not saved. Somebody can come in here and pretend it. I'm saved, I call upon Jesus Christ as Lord. Then I'm going to view you as saved because you said it with your own mouth. And in the end, when God sorts through, that'll be a bad day for you. Don't play games. 
And God has a way of sorting out what needs to be sorted out. And he will do it. That's a guarantee. So it's, it's you know, the unbelievers not saved. God wants them saved. And you and I have become the example of Christ for them to see. Love them. Love them. Don't badger them into the kingdom of heaven. Show them the kindness, the mercy, and the grace that he shows you each and every day. And they'll be drawn to him. And when they come to him and they cry out to him, he will save them. God is not a promise breaker. He's a promise keeper. And he's the ultimate promise keeper. So you and I have been called by God to be their example. And and God who called you knows what he's doing. We looked at this before, right? God knew what he got when he got you. He He knows what you're all about. He knows every part of your being. He knows how your brain works. He knows how your heart works. He knows it all. And he wasn't going, ugh. Not him. (laughs) I never thought in a million years he'd come up and ask Christ to be his savior. No, he knew exactly what he got when he got you. And he wants to use you. And the fact that we're still here is the fact that he's saying there's still people only you can reach. There are people that no one else in this fellowship are going to step into someone's life there. They're in your life for a purpose and a reason. Show them my son. Be an example to them. How do I show them your son without speaking? Face your suffering with joy. Because anybody who suffers, anybody understand suffering here? Everyone else. We all know it, right? The world knows suffering. And they also can see very clearly when you're suffering and yet you retain joy. And they go, what are you all about? And they go, let me tell you what I'm all about. It's not about me. It's not about my church. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what it's all about. And it it will always be all about him. And that's what he's showing them there in a very, very strong way. They'll never learn of his love for them from the world because the world's constantly trying to take them captive and misdirect them. So what Peter's saying here is, make sure you take a good look at this. If such heavy trials come upon us and we're saved by our faith in Christ, think about those who are not saved. What will become of them at the end? Keep that in your mind. So in my suffering, he's saying, learn to honestly examine yourself. Are you suffering because of your own doing or are you suffering because of Christ in you? And only one of those ways will show the world Christ. So he's saying, you know, we're still here for a reason. The reason is that they may come to know Jesus. And then in verse 19, therefore, to sum it up, right, those uh, also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. What Peter's saying here is to sum it all up, don't think of these sufferings we face as strange if we're really facing them because we're suffering for Christ. And if we're suffering for Christ, then simply just entrust your soul to God with joy. Why? Because God, the God whom we serve, is the only faithful God who loves his creation and his desire is only to do what's best for it. He wants his best for me and he wants his best for you. And to get me to that place, to get you to that place, if we're going to follow Christ, is going to require suffering. And he suffered I'm going to suffer, but it's going to bring me to the place where he wants me to be. I can look back on my life and see a lot of suffering that I faced in my life. Is that part of what brought me here to teach his word to you? Probably. Probably molded me into what? And probably a lot more molding to go in my life. And what's the purpose? His glory. And to remember, we're all in this together. 
We're not facing it alone. So if I'm truly suffering for the will of God, that means every appointment of my life is by his hand. It means that every circumstance is under his direction. Every situation is laid down by his order. What? All for the good of his people, for the salvation of the lost, and for the glory of his name. And as we endure through it by trusting Jesus, it becomes apparent to all those that watch us that, you know what? I can trust God too. If you can trust him and face all that you just faced and not just be a broken down ball of flesh, you come through it, you're strong, you retain this, I can do that too. And we're here for that purpose, for that reason. Sometimes it takes takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. It really does. It doesn't happen overnight. We face it trial after trial after trial, and you got to keep in the back of your mind, God put a fellowship of believers together so we can get through this together. How many times have you tried to do it alone? It don't work, do it? No way, it doesn't work. It just makes it worse. But you come into where God's people are, and there's strength there. There's joy there. and It's a great, a great, great picture painted for us in scripture. I'm going to close with Isaiah chapter 40. You probably know it very well. 28 through 31. It says, do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. And though young men grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That's you and I. God's given us that promise, and we hold on to it. So in your suffering, understand maybe why you're suffering. Lord, is it because you've done this? It's all for your glory. Take joy in that, that you know you're his. And learn to find rest in the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you've given us to be here today. To walk through your word, to hear your heart, to hear your voice. Lord, take your word that was taught today. Let it be planted in every heart. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit so it might take root quickly so the enemy could not steal it away. Let it accomplish your purpose, Lord. Let it bear fruit for your glory. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this time. We give it back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.